Who knew that Dartmouth had two fairies that would end their careers up in flames? Hello, I'm Joanne. I'm the manager curator at the Dartmouth Heritage Museum, and I'm here in the program support building at Evergreen House to tell you the tale of two fairies. Right beside me here on either side, I have a picture of what's called the Halifax Ferry in this picture, but it's actually the Annex 2, later changed its name to the Halifax Ferry. And on this side, we've got the Governor Cornwallis Ferry up in flames. What, to, what connects these two? Well, I'm about to tell you. So the Annex 2 here, we're talking about the time frame of around 1890s. So if you ask Dartmouthians what Dartmouth might be known for, one of the things they might tell you is the ferry. Uh, it's an iconic part of Dartmouth's culture here, the Dartmouth Halifax Ferry. One of the ferries that I'm going to talk to you to today about is the Annex 2. This ferry was commissioned in uh, the 1890s. There were a couple of ferries already running the harbor at that time, but they realized they needed a third. Uh, traffic was getting heavy, they needed a third uh, to carry people across. People and horses at this time. So they needed to commission a new ferry, and this was a big win for Dartmouth. Dartmouthians have always been firm on one fact. Dartmouth and Halifax are not the same. Dartmouthians are not Haligonians. Dartmouth is not less than Halifax. In 1890, this came to heads when the Halifax Dartmouth Steam Ferry Company decided to propose a fare increase. Now, Dartmouthians revolted at this. They were the ones using the ferry to travel across the harbor, and they saw this as a venture at lining the pockets of the Halifax businessmen. So what did Dartmouth do? They proposed the People's Ferry. The People's Ferry would be free for everyone to come across and it would be totally independent of the Dartmouth Halifax Steam Ferry Company. So what resulted was a kind of rebranding, a cooperative strategy that ended in the Dartmouth Ferry Commission. And at this time, the big purchase was a new ferry. There were two boats already, but they needed another one. They knew the others were getting past their time and you know, traffic was, was substantial, so they needed another ferry. So Dartmouth's new project was to buy a new ferry and this was going to be great. It's going to be the best ferry that there ever was. It was the first purchase for the Dartmouth Ferry Commission. So they went to New Baltimore in New York and purchased the Annex 2, which we see right here. The Annex 2 uh, had been ferrying people from Brooklyn to New Jersey for quite some time and was being sold to the Dartmouth Ferry Commission. The great new thing about the Annex 2 was that it had a beam engine. The beam engine would come across the top it's not seen on this picture because later on that was covered over due to the weather that we get. The beam engine worked really well in the sheltered harbors of the United States, not so well in the open waters of Halifax Harbor. So the beam engine was covered over. There was a lot of excitement around this new great ferry that was coming into town. People were gathering across the harbor. They wanted to see when this new ferry would come and begin service from Dartmouth to Halifax. It was a great exciting time. So they were following the news. Yarmouth carried a news article saying that it, they saw the ferry pass by and excitement grew. They knew that the ferry would approach in the evening sometime. So a crowd gathered around the wharf. They knew that this ferry was going to dock at Warner's Wharf, which was one down from the Halifax Dartmouth Steam Ferry Commission spot. So they were gathering around this wharf and there was a platform set out, a dock. It was a lightweight platform. It was only 18 feet by 10 feet, held up by galvanized chains. There were a couple of officials waiting at this dock for the ferry to arrive. And there was a barrier set across the wharf so that the public couldn't come onto this dock. And police were telling the people that were gathering, you know, stop where you are, come no further. You can watch the ferry dock from where you are on the wharf. You can't come down to this dock. Well, the people of Dartmouth were not happy about that. They wanted to see this great big new ferry come into town. 
So they started pushing their way through the gates. They pushed their way through the gates, crowding this very small dock. And as the ferry approached, the captain, Kinley, noticed that he wasn't going to be able to throw his ropes and anchor and dock the way he normally would. So he went a little bit further down the, the dock. And everybody, of course, pushed further and further, and there were no barriers for these people. So as the crowd pushed, people decided that they would try to jump from the dock onto the ferry. One of these people happened to be a very spry uh, woman. She was a clergyman's wife. She made it from the dock onto the ferry. However, as the crowd pushed forward, the dock wouldn't hold. The dock collapsed into the water in this very short small space, dozens of people perhaps were falling into the water. Now panic ensued. People were said to be fainting on the shore, cries for help. It was pandemonium. This great celebration had turned to chaos. So people were shouting for help. They were throwing things into the water. Other people saw, oh, I'm going to help. They're throwing life preservers. I'm going to throw chunks of wood. These chunks of wood will be something that the people in the water will be able to hold on to and save themselves. Well, the chunks of wood hit people, knocking them unconscious and causing more chaos in the water. So that evening, people were jumping in, helping where they could. Uh, about four survivors were pulled from the water. Many more were actually saved. Uh, one of the people saved from the uh, from drowning that night was a little baby, little uh, Miss Logan's child. Miss Logan was the wife of the engineer on board the Annex 2, and she was waiting to see her husband come to shore. Uh, and caught, got caught up in the excitement. Uh, but the infant child was saved, as were several others. Now the search went on into the night, and as it got dark, torches were called for, and the search continued. Uh, around 11 p.m., a diver uh, was asked to join the search. However, when this diver showed up, the commissioners were gone and not having anyone to direct him where to go or what to do, he up and left. Uh, so the diver refused to help. So later that the next day, um, it wasn't known how many people were lost. Uh, it was surprising surmised that around a dozen, maybe two dozen, had been swept away in the currents under the boat. Um, they were never found, not properly identified. One thing that was left in the aftermath was hats, hats floating in the harbor. Now a lot of the survivors had left their hats, of course, when they were rescued. Uh, however, other hats were left behind too. So about 13 women's hats and seven men's hats were found floating and retrieved from the water. And they were actually set up uh, in the Annex 2, lining the benches. So people would come aboard and see if they could identify any missing loved ones uh, by the hats that were left behind. Now this is a scene that Dartmouth would remember for quite some time. News outlets across the Maritimes would exaggerate this extensively, saying hundreds of people were killed in this mishap. Uh, that's not the case. That wasn't as many people as that. Um, then, of course, there was the blame game. Uh, whose fault was it that this happened uh, from the conflict between Dartmouth and Halifax. If if Halifax had been, you know, more cooperative with Dartmouth, Dartmouth wouldn't have gotten so excited and ra rampaged the docks. Um, anything from the Dartmouth-Halifax uh, disagreement to the police could have done better at keeping people at bay. Um, there were many, many uh, things talked about uh, for the blame game. However, hindsight is twenty twenty. Now, what's the connection between the Annex 2 and our burning Cornwallis ferry? Well, the Annex 2 actually went on to service the Dartmouth-Halifax Harbor uh, for nearly two decades. Its service came to an end when it caught fire and uh, the reason was suspected arson. After that, that was the end of the uh, Annex 2 service across the harbor. We're now going to switch gears to the Cornwallis ferry here. We're moving on from the 1890s until the 1940s. In the 1940s, we're talking about wartime. 
a lot different atmosphere than we have with the uh, early ferries. Later on, when the wartime came and automobiles became more popular, we're talking about transporting automobiles too, cars and trucks and such. Uh, the problem during the 1940s was the traffic that arose. Uh, they had people and police uh, monitoring traffic and controlling the traffic flow, especially from the old ferry road uh, to the dock. Uh, you'd have lineups of cars. It was becoming unbearable for people. So a new ferry was needed. They had a couple of ferries servicing the harbor. They needed a new one. Well, this was uh, the shining time for the ferry service. $150,000 was earned uh, over about 1944. Six million passengers transported across. This was a pretty busy year for the ferries. Uh, so a new ferry was needed. Well, the commissioner at the time, uh, Pierce, said, my neighbor, uh, you might recognize this name, my neighbor is William Rouet. William Rouet was the designer of the Blue Nose. Uh, the Blue Nose had been designed a couple of decades earlier. Mr. Pierce asked him to design a new ferry for the Halifax Dartmouth Harbor. Uh, so this new ferry was designed. At first they thought, well, we'll design a new steel ferry. This costs a lot of money. It was outrageous. So they decided to go with a timber ferry. This timber ferry uh, would be the best, another one, the best ferry that would service Dartmouth and Halifax that ever was. So William Rouet was on board to design it and uh, a Dartmouth company was commissioned to build it. Uh, the Dartmouth company belonged to Hugh Weagle. The last Dartmouth company to build a ferry uh, was the one that designed and built the Chibucto in 1862. So this is nearly 100 years later and another ferry was going to be built in Dartmouth uh, and by a Nova Scotian uh, designer, so a lot of lot of excitement over this ferry as well. Now the Governor Cornwallis ferry, uh, they had a naming contest. Uh, they had school children come up with a name for the new ferry. They had names like the Queen Victoria uh, bantied about, and they decided on the Governor Cornwallis. Now today that name brings a lot of a lot of aggravation, a lot of disdain, a lot of why would you name something after that man? In those days, history was looked at a little bit differently, in a different light. Uh, we try to tell all sides of the story now. Um, we're talking about a very colonialized history uh, prior to this. So they named the ferry the Governor Cornwallis. It was greeted with a lot of fanfare. In 1941, uh, there was going to be a christening of the boat. The boat was ready. Um, they had it up uh, on the banks, ready to be brought out into sea. Uh, a daughter of uh, a local politician, a local mayor, I believe, uh, Madame Eisner, or Mademoiselle Eisner, she was brought down to christen the boat. She hit her champagne bottle on that keel, that keel that was made of oak, no less. Um, uh, Rue had put that into the plans. He thought that that would be a, be a much better keel than what was originally planned. So she banged her champagne bottle on that oak keel with much fanfare and excitement. And after a little bit of work, took a lot of work to get it uh, off the rollers and into the harbor, but it was eventually launched and a lot of excitement. Now a year later, she was outfitted uh, to the ninth degree, uh, very exciting. It had uh, glass encased decks so that it allowed for more seating. It had uh, three um, lanes for cars to, to park on and to ferry across. Uh, we're also talking about a time prior to the bridges being constructed. So having the ferry was a big deal. So a year later, 1942, she was christened again and she set sail uh, to much fanfare, a lot of excitement. Now that wouldn't last. Over the course of the two years that uh, she ran, it was nothing but trouble. Pierce cataloged in his log books, failure after failure and repair after repair. Uh, she wasn't the dream that everyone had thought she would be. Her last voyage uh, was in December of 1944. Uh, she 
left harbor from Halifax with about 300 to 400 passengers. And right away, the engine crew knew something was wrong. They uh, spotted fire in the ceiling between the uh, false ceiling and the deck head in the engine room. And instead of alerting the captain to this, they kept it calm. They knew that it would cause pandemonium to have uh, the crew alerted at this time. So they kept the fire at bay with their extinguishers until the ferry could cross to Dartmouth. All the while, nobody knew that the boat was on fire. So these uh, engine crew, they maintained the fire, kept it at bay, allowed the ship to dock in Dartmouth. Most of the passengers were actually off the boat by the time they even knew that anything was wrong. So the fire commission was called. They came out and told the engine crew that they needed to leave. They were dismissed and the fire was out of control at that point. Uh, the only thing left to do was tug the Governor Cornwallis out to the harbor, out to George's Island where it would be beached and uh, left to sink. And to my knowledge, that's where she rests today. Uh, you're probably wondering what the names of those two engine crew were that saved the lives of those hundreds of people on that boat that day. Uh, that would be engineer Carmichael and oiler Hor Robin. And they were the ones that prevented um, lives from being lost that day. A lot of blame, once again, whose fault was this that the fire started? Um, you know, the new thing about this boat was that it had a diesel electric engine. It was the first ferry uh, in the commission to be diesel electric. Now, was it a problem with people not really understanding how that engine worked and how, how, pro how to properly maintain it? Uh, was it the fact that maybe parts and service wasn't really well known for this type of engine in this area. Well, it turned out, according to the fire marshal, that this had nothing to do with the type of engine. Uh, it was a faulty furnace pipe that had been installed incorrectly. It was his opinion that it was bound to happen. Fire was inevitable uh, for this particular ferry. So that's the tale of the Governor Cornwallis and the Annex Two ferries. Uh, we welcome you to come to the Dartmouth Heritage Museum to find out more about the history of the Dartmouth Ferry. It's one of our iconic uh, symbols for the Dartmouth area. We can even tell you the story of the only ferry that was in the harbor at the time of the Halifax explosion, and Helen Creighton's father happened to be on that ferry. We look forward to seeing you, and thank you for watching.